And this old man is presiding over a debate. But the debate is going on in his mind. And uh, like every good speaker, he allows the pros and the cons to have an equal speech. And he listens to a negative thought in his mind and a positive. And the debate is about the notion, life is worth living. And he cannot decide whether his life has been worth living or not. And he keeps listening to the pros and the cons, the yeas and the nays, trying to decide whether the motion is carried or defeated. Now it's awful to reach the end of life and to be debating that question because you only get one bite of the cherry. You only get one chance to live. Yesterday has gone. You can't have it back again. You only get one time around. And to get to the end of life and feel that you've missed it, that's terrible. It explains the midlife crisis many men have. They, they often reach their goals in their forties. They get to the top and look around and there's nothing. What's it all been for? What's it all been about? And many men in middle years try and start all over again and they trade in the family saloon for a sports car and they trade in the wife for a later model and they, you know, they, they go crazy because they feel, I've missed it. I've got to start again. And second and third marriages trying to capture life, trying to make the most of it before it's gone. It's a very, very common problem. All right, well, Solomon is debating, what are we here for? What's life all about? Is life worth living? How can we make the most of life? And that's probably the most important question any human being can ask. Precisely because we only get it once. Many, I'm afraid, don't even bother to ask. They just feed their bodies, keep their job going, and they just exist. What a tragedy. The waste of life just exists. Keeping body and soul together. Many people just do that. They're so concerned with how to keep going. But why keep going? This is nothing worth keeping going for. Well, now let's look at the negative side of the debate first. Have I, have I wasted? What's it all been? And his opening statement, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Now, unfortunately, that's a bad translation because the word vanity today means pride. Those cars had a vanity mirror on one of the um, sun sheets. You notice which side it's used on whatever. Um, it simply means a pride mirror. And the word vanity today simply means pride, nothing more. But in older English, vanity means emptiness. It's to do a thing in vain. older English, vanity means emptiness. It's to do a thing in vain.
useless, wasted. And I think the nearest English word to vanity is pointless. Here's a man who gets to the end of life and says, pointless, pointless. It's all the pointless. Now that is a very, very sad conclusion. Or useless, useless, utterly useless, as one modern translation puts it. Now, he had been in a position to have anything he wanted and to do anything he wanted. First, he was king, so he had the power to do anything he wanted. He also had the wealth. He was a very rich man. If money could buy it, he could buy it, and he did. He had fame, too. Now, these are the things most men want. Well, power or fame. To find some meaning in life. To make life worth living. Well, he was fabulously wealthy and so famous that the Queen of Sheba came on a pilgrimage just to meet him and see what he was like. And she said, the heart has not been told. Now, he said, I've tried everything. And he gives a list of his interests. And they cover a huge range of human activity. The first thing he tried was science. And a particular branch of science he studied was agriculture, and he went in for cattle breeding. And he really studied it, and he bred some fine cattle. But it didn't satisfy him. It was interesting while it lasted. It didn't satisfy him. So he then turned to the arts, and he tried two branches of the arts. Music was the first, and of course he inherited a love of music from his dad, but he, he he really went into music, studied the instruments, had orchestras playing before, and yet it began to pour. So he then moved into architecture. That is satisfying to build a great building, see it be there, long after you're gone. Very satisfying. The architecture, exactly after liberty was so. And then he tried collecting pictures. And he built galleries and he collected pictures from the whole world. Paid fortune for them all. They were all mine, and you walk along the gallery between his pictures. But pretty soon that began to bore him, so he tried entertainment. Now, he didn't have TV, he couldn't, so he got caught comedian. And they came in and they put on a sitcom for him, regularly in the palace, and he wrapped himself so he could go to bed. And laughed at the king. Comedy. Have a good laugh. That's, that's what life's all about. Have a good laugh. You heard that, anyway? And he tried that. And it was fun while it lasted, but it wasn't that. So then he went to the business, and he amassed a fortune in the commercial world. And he really was good at buying a job. And he really kind of made money. And there was lots more than he made. And yet, somehow, that did satisfy. So then he tried pleasure. And he tried pleasure. Ja, kui ma 
and it says that God orders our time. As the psalmist says, our time is in his hands. And when you believe that your life is in God's hands and that he knows the right time for you to dance and the right time for you to weep, then the things that happen to you are not chance. They're God's choice for you. And he's weaving a pattern out of his life. And life won't be one long picnic. And life won't be happiness all the way, because that's bad for us. Do you realize that if our feelings were always on the same level, we wouldn't have any feelings? Let me think about that. Not because we have lows, but we have highs. If your feelings were always the same, you wouldn't have any feelings. Thank God for feelings. There are times when we'll feel like dancing, and there are times when we don't. There's a time to kiss and a time to stop. Now, uh, I've written a chord to that list, we're going to sing it. Um, I've put it to a well-known tune, you will all be able to sing, and uh, it's about time, but it begins and ends, where Ecclesiastes 3 begins and ends, with God deciding the right time for us to go to a particular experience. Isn't it a lovely thought to sing it? If something happens to you, that put your lives in God's hands, then it's the right thing to happen at that time. This is not fatalism. Fatalism believes in an impersonal faith that nobody can affect. That's quite different from God's free choice of what he will allow happen to. And he will bury our lives so that his purpose is fulfilled in him. Well, let's sing it together, all right? God is sovereign. Let the seasons take our birthday. Now the favorite saying of my father was, uh, 
Life is long enough to live out God's purpose, but it's too short to wait a moment. Well, that's what he's saying in Ecclesiastes 3. Our times are in his hands. And he will decide, not in an arbitrary, predestination kind of way, but he will decide what is best for us in the next time, the next part of our life. Isn't it good to have somebody looking after us like that? And to know that if the next part of the road is tough and unhappy, well, he has decided that's going to be for our good. And he has brought it, and he will see us through. And our character will be formed by it for our future blessing. See, this is where the longer view of happiness in the next world really makes a lot of difference. Really does. See, this world is so brief and so fleeting. Now, I've got a theory as to why. When I was 20, one year was the 20th of my memory. When I was 40, one year was the 40th of my memory. When I was 60, one year was the 60th of my memory. Next week I'm 63, so one year is the 63rd of my memory. And so that's my theory. Life gets compressed in your memory. And it seems to go quicker and quicker and quicker, doesn't it? It seems no time at all since we were last year. Did you ever? I've had two conferences here since then. One or two of you then came to our next conference and then the life just rushes by. But we've got all eternity to benefit from what we've done in this world. All eternity to enjoy the good things of God without all that. We've got everything to live for. The other chapter, which has a strong sense of the presence of God in it, is of course chapter 12. And chapter 12 really is worth reading to you because uh, it's written by this old man. And I do want to read it because it's such a good description of old age. And since I'm now one foot in the grave and the other one's in our skin, it's good to read chapters like this. Listen to it. Young man, he says, I'm starting in chapter 11, verse 9, because, oh, these chapter divisions are so messed up, aren't they? I wish we could all have a Bible without chapter and verse numbers in it. We'd really know the Bible then. Now I'm going to begin with, chap with chapter 11, verse 7. It's a wonderful thing to be alive. If a person lives to be very old, let him rejoice in every day of life. But let him also remember that eternity is far longer and that everything down here is futile by comparison. Young men, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Or do all you want to. Take in everything. But realize that you must account to God for everything you do. So banish grief and pain, but remember that youth with a whole life before it can make serious mistakes. Don't let the excitement of being young cause you to forget about your creator. Honor him in your youth before the evil years come when you will no longer enjoy living. It will be too late then to try to remember him. When the sun and light and moon and stars are dim to your own eyes and there is no silver lining left among the clouds. For there will come a time when your limbs will tremble with age and your strong legs will become weak and your teeth will be too few to do their work. And there will be blindness too. Then let your lips be tightly closed while eating. And your teeth are gone. And you will wake at dawn with the first note of the birds. But you yourself will be deaf and tuneless with a quavering voice. You will be afraid of heights and of falling. A white head with an old man dragging himself along without sexual desire, standing at death's door, and nearing his everlasting home at the morning's door on the streets. Yes, remember your Creator now, while you are young, before the nature is broken at the fountain, and the wheel is broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the dead, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. All is futile, the preacher. All two times. But then, because the preacher was wise, he went on teaching the people all he knew. And he collected proverbs and classified them. For the preacher was not only a wise man, he was a good teacher. He not only taught what he knew to the people, 
But he taught them in an interesting manner. The wise man's words are like gold that spur to action. They nail down the important truth. Thank you. 
Возьмите позвон коробки отсюда, сюда, в коридор.
Да я оттуда все повышуривала на бороду. А потом обратно. Ну, Ja seal võt need triiulid kõik pane kohale võt, seal võt need, need triiulid kõik seal. Aga kus on minu niukene kolmas tool võt niukene? Kas on need oli? Eh? Kas on need oli kolmas? Nii, siin on kaks, aga kolmas kus on? Sama sugune. Võtta tea. Ei tea. 